My name is Matt Skinner, and I am the Scholar for Adult Education at Westminster Presbyterian Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And this is another installment in our series, Big Questions for a Changing Church. In this series, we are looking at how the COVID-19 pandemic and the renewed imperative to confront systemic racism are both changing how we as a congregation and as a nation perceive God, the church, and our work in the world. And so weekly, I will invite in a different theologian who will share their perspectives on ways in which congregations can be changing creatively, thinking differently, nourishing themselves spiritually, and accompanying their neighbors more generously. And today, my guest is the Reverend Dr. Brian Blunt, who is president and professor of New Testament in the Walter W. Moore and Charles E.S. Kramer presidential chairs at Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. He's been at Union for 13 years. Previously, he taught at Princeton Theological Seminary for 15 years. Uh, we could go all day on, on the bio, but he's uh, written six books, uh, co-author or co-editor of several others, focused largely on the Gospel according to Mark, uh, the Book of Revelation, and New Testament interpretation, particularly how our cultural background affects how we interpret uh, scripture. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Blunt was a parish pastor for six years, is that right? That's right, right. And also has served as president of the Society for Biblical Literature, which is uh, the most prominent uh, academic society for those who study biblical texts and history and traditions. Uh, we could go on and on, but I'd rather hear you talk. So welcome. Thanks for joining me today, Brian. Well, it's good to be with you, Matt. It's good to see you again and have this chance to be in conversation. It is indeed, and I'm thrilled for what you can bring to the conversations that we're having at Westminster Presbyterian, but also even beyond as people uh, find their way to, to this conversation. I, I wanna start with the question of witness, and to put that in context, not everybody watching this will know, but you wrote a statement for the Union website, which also got picked up by a Presbyterian publication. People can find it pretty easily if they just Google Brian Blunt, George Floyd, I believe it's the first thing that will pop up, but it's a statement in response to uh, the murder of George Floyd. And you say boldly uh, in this uh, that, the white, that white Christians are not witnessing, not enough. Uh, maybe, that's, maybe you've said what you need to say already right there, but I'd love to unpack that a little bit and talk about this nature, or I'm sorry, the, the notion of this thing called bearing witness and where that comes from for you and, and how we um, put some handles on that notion of what it means to bear witness right here, right now. Yes, well, as you know, I've done a commentary and, and some other works on the book of Revelation, as you said at the beginning. And for me, the term and the concept come from a great deal of the work that I've done there using the language of um, martyreo in the Greek, um, the martyr language, the witness language, um, standing up and declaring one's relationship uh, with God and with Christ. And in the book of Revelation, John's concern is that his followers in the seven churches witness to the lordship of Jesus Christ in a context where that could be a very difficult and dangerous thing to do. It could cost you. It could cost you social standing. Um, fellow peers in your social community turning their back on you because of how you were accused of being this Christ believer. It could cost you um, your position in society or it could cost you your life. Uh, there were some people, Antipas, who is mentioned in the book, um, who was killed as a result. Um, all also John, who's exiled on Patmos as a result. John points to Jesus as the first true witness, the one who stood up for his own lordship, his relationship to God, and was therefore crucified as a result. John is asking his believers to be willing to stand up for Jesus in the way that Jesus stood up for his own identity as God's Messiah and God's son. His concern is that people in his churches are buying into the Roman, Greco-Roman way of life so that um, they would rather um, um, blend into the Roman economy, the Ro Roman religious and political infrastructure. They would like to be seen um, in a way that didn't bring danger to them in their lives. If the Romans wanted them to worship Greco-Roman gods, well, let's do that. Um, even if they understood and believed that their own their only true loyalty in terms of faith should be to Christ. So John's is, John is concerned because he knows that if you stand up and declare your 
ultimate and exclusive allegiance, faith allegiance to Christ, that you will be persecuted. His churches aren't being persecuted, so therefore he knows his churches aren't witnessing. So a church that's comfortable and quiet in his context is a church that is not witnessing. So what I've done is to look at that language and that concern and apply it to our contemporary circumstance. When we think about what it means to witness to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in a situation where uh, African Americans, particularly as we talked about in that statement, George Floyd, but we know there are many other persons, um, Trayvon Martin, um, um, Eric Garner. I mean, I could go on with a, with a list, Breonna Taylor, who was in Louisville. There's a long list um, of, of persons in that context. Um, it is not just them, but it is the system of systemic racism that has allowed a culture to um, allow persons in the culture with certain abilities and um, authorities to respond in unjust ways to particular people based on um, their lack of respect for who they are as people based on the color of their skin. So how do we then, knowing that that is not the intended um, understanding that God has for this creation, that that is not the way in which the world reveals how God understands the world intended to be revealed in the life of Jesus of Nazareth, the kind of world we're committed to if we are committed to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. How do we, in the midst of that circumstance, witness to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? I'm arguing that if we are too quiet, it's um, a circumstance very much like John and his seven churches. He knows if you're quiet, you're not speaking out against the circumstance that is um, negative for um, this revelation of God's intent in the world. If we are quiet as Christians, while we know a circumstance has taken place and is continuing to take hold, um, in this case, systemic racism that does not reflect God's intentions for our world, we then too are not witnessing to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So what I was saying in that piece was one, I look at myself first and say, I. Um, um, have to recognize I have not witnessed enough because I have um, um, many cases wanted to hold on to normalcy and um, um, not feel like um, I'm stepping out too far on a limb and because of that I've not witnessed enough so I want to start with myself but I also want to look at the world of uh, white Christians as I say in that reflection and argue that um, this community that has a tremendous amount of, um, of respect, authority, economic wherewithal, and um, political and legislative connection, that if they are quiet in this moment, they are not witnessing to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And to try to help them figure out and help me figure out how I can make that witness better. So it's a theological, biblical understanding that lives itself out in a current social and political circumstance. I like how at the end there you you talked about what that looks like for for people today, especially people who might be influential in their own circles, whether that's politically or in business or education, have a have a role to play that is more than just saying this is wrong, or more than just saying Jesus loves you, or more than just saying, you know, I, I, why don't you all come to church <laughs> at my church this Sunday, that bearing witness is more than just saying I'm Christian, but it has to do with if you have access to the levers of power, you've got to do something about that. Am I hearing you right? Yes, you are hearing me right. That's the point I'm trying to make here in this case. Um, you know, people have asked me, well, okay, what is it that you want or would like to see after I wrote that piece? What would you like to see white Christians do? And I begin um, by saying, the first thing I think it is very helpful, unless you're, let's say, um, you know, a U.S. senator or a governor or something like that, you don't have to start with the big thing. Um, too often people think, well, I can't make the kind of change that's necessary and therefore I become paralyzed. I don't do the things I can do um, because it's just too big a problem, too big an issue. So I said, well, the same thing we tell students, don't look at the syllabus the first day and think you can't do everything in the course. Look at the syllabus day by day, take it in the pieces and develop and you'll see that the course will come out right. Um, the same thing I think we happen in, would happen in this case as we think about witnessing. So begin to think first, how might I in my own interpersonal um, relationships and circumstances be able to witness to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in the terms of um, racial equality and justice in this country? So the things I have heard said before, maybe now I don't let those things go unchallenged. 
um, things I have thought about um, that might help others grow in their, their, their understanding of how um, our spirituality lives itself out in social and political ways. Maybe I become more vocal about that. So I start in those small ways, but then I begin to think, well, I'm also a member of a congregation and historically um, the white church in the United States has, um, particularly the Presbyterian church, has um, in its membership people who are um, well-to-do, um, who are, have connections to people in power and legislature and in, in the, in the, in the um, mayor's offices and the governor's mansions, etc. cetera, um, use those connections um, to be able to speak out not just about one's faith, which is very important to do, but how that faith then translates into how we should live with others of God's people in the world around us. Um, so to um, make use of the gifts that we have, um, the gifts of, um, of uh, opportunity, the gifts of relationship, the gifts of status, um, particularly those of us who have certain um, positions, be it in law firms or medical firms or in the um, in political and legislative offices, to take advantage of those relationships and connections and identities to begin to think, well, what do I believe God's intent is in this particular circumstance and then to try to use those connections and capabilities to as best as one can um, help people realize that vision and that identity. I try to tell people all the time that um, it's important for me because as you know, I work a lot with apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic is literature that is um, about the revealing of God's future intent for the present time. Well, what is God's future intent? Um, it is um, uh, that, it, well, I go back to the book of Revelation, it's all tribes and tongues and nations and people coming together before God. It's the Pentecost story in the book of Acts. Well, if that's the vision that God has in the future for God's people, our goal, our call would be to work for that vision in the present. And that has something meaningful and important to say about this present circumstance in which we find ourselves right now. Yeah, to say, if that sounds good for the future, why not? Trying to live yes. in it now in the present. Right, yeah. yeah. Right. I, in Revelation, of course, the, the, the problem is the empire. Well, among other things, the evil that animates that empire. And the message is, don't worry, it's all going to fall down one day at the end. Or not, don't worry, but God's going to take care of the ultimate thing. But it's always this, but what does faithfulness look like for you, for these congregations? In a, in a previous installment in this series, I interviewed... Margaret Amer, and she used the language from uh, the movie Frozen 2. What's the next best step? Uh -huh. She always said, it's kind of like the syllabus, right? You don't have to necessarily in ingest it all at once or figure out exactly how you're going to get there, but what's the best next step mm -hmm. for you to take? And what you're saying, I think, is that might not be the safest step <laughs> or the most comfortable step, but... And no, I think that's, no. a, that's the difficulty for us as people of faith. Um, um, we want... Well, one of the whole um, goals I've talked to across my many years of living now um, is that uh, people come to church and come to faith with the hope that they, they can find comfort, that they can find peace, that they can find a sense of stability. So it is against um, the expectation of many people of faith to believe that my faith is going to make me uncomfortable because I seek it out because I'm looking for comfort in, in, in my relationship with God, my relationship with Christ as a Christian. So when you then change that and to suggest that um, it's not just about being comfortable, it's also about finding a way to bring comfort and hope to those who are without it and who have historically been without it. So the healing, exercising reality of the Gospels is also a part of our understanding and identity as Christian believers. Um, Jesus's um, healing and exorcisms in the Gospel of Mark, you know, I also work a good bit in the Gospel of Mark. Um, those are moments where we think, well, yes, that brings a great deal of calm and comfort to the person who has been possessed or the person who is broken. But what we also know when you read those texts is that whenever Jesus heals and exercises, people get mad, they get angry because it transforms the circumstance. It reconfigures, 
relationship in those circumstances. It makes us think a different way about purity and holiness and who can be pure and who can be holy. And all of those changes and transformations are not just the physical in sense of the healings and the exorcisms, but it's a renewed sense of personhood that challenges the established understanding of what it means to be a person in the first century. So I look at um, what we're called to do is to um, reimagine um, and represent healing and exorcism in our lives as Christians today. No, that doesn't mean we go around looking for demons to pull demons out of people who possess, but it does mean that we go look for those circumstances where evil is manifest and find ways to cast it out. And that can create as much turmoil for us in our circumstance as it did for Jesus in his circumstance. I think systemic racism is an evil that possesses. If you encounter, engage, and try to exercise, that may look good for the person who is a victim of racism, but it can also cause a great deal of disruption in the societal circumstance in which you and that person are found. So it's not just about comfort. It's about um, bringing comfort. And sometimes bringing comfort um, brings trouble. Yeah, those clashing kingdoms in Mark's gospel, evil doesn't give up without a fight. It doesn't deceive right. ground without a fight. Never does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to flip back to Revelation really quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in yeah. terms of that call to witness, this might be the most that some people at Westminster have ever thought about the book of Revelation. So this is great, <laughs> right? It's not one of the books we usually settle into, but like you said, a really important book because of the way in which the author is calling those seven churches into a new way of being out of a sense of comfort or complacency and into a real dangerous space that this, that this witness bearing is. I wanna ask you to comment on the differences between the experience of a lot of contemporary churches, which I know is impossible to generalize what it's like to be Christian today, versus those ancient congregations, because chances are those ancient congregations didn't feel especially complicit in the evils of the Roman Empire. Mm. I wonder if there's a difference for at least some Western Christians, some white Christians, people who are a lot more, where the church is a lot more enmeshed in politi the political economic realities of our day. Not to say that those are always evil, but they're always powerful. And, and does that make sense in terms of the, the connection I'm looking at there, or the difference between an ancient experience of life under the empire and what ours is today? Yes, no, I, I see what the point that you're, you're making, and you're right. Um, you look at John's churches, um, uh, they are not um, part of the Roman infrastructure, and that's clear. Um, they, they, they are identified as outsiders, and of course, you know the circumstance. Um, when um, a Christian in the first century in Asia Minor, where John was right into these seven churches, there was no systematic persecution of Christians. However, it was clear, we know from letters from governors to the Roman emperor that um, in circumstances where a person was um, accused of being a Christian and that person could be hauled before a tribunal and then all these negative kind of things up to the losing of one's life that happened. But otherwise, uh, so, so in that cir situation, circumstance is very different than a contemporary Christian believer or a contemporary Christian church. We don't have to worry about flying under the radar, hoping that nobody will see us so that um, we aren't going to get caught up in all of the, the difficulties that I have. No one's going to accuse Brian Blunt of being a Christian and then Brian's going to be hauled before a tribunal and or, or Brian's church, that, that type of circumstance. So yes, there's that difference. What is very similar, however, is that John is concerned that um, his believers want to become what we already are. And that is to say, they want to be enmeshed in the social and political circumstance in a way they're not, that they are not troublesome to the people in, in positions of power in Rome. They want to blend in. Um, so that um, they are no longer um, looked at as an outsider. They want to be a part of the inside. And John looks at, at, looks at that and says, well, if you do that, in order to do that, 
you're going to, and you know the symbolism, you're going to have to take on the mark of the beast. And uh, for him, that symbolism was you're going to have to participate in the economic infrastructure. You're going to have to participate in the political infrastructure. You're going to have to participate in the military conquest. You're going to have to serve in the military. All these kinds of things, that's the mark of the beast for John, that you bought into a situation and circumstance that does not have its ultimate allegiance to God, but has its ultimate allegiance to itself and wants you to worship itself. So there is a similarity and a concern, I think, that John has for his first century Christians that we would want to have for the church today because we're kind of already there. We, we're ahead of, 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 the, um, of the first century churches. We've already become a part of the culture. Um, we don't have any trepidation, most of us, for example, and I'm not suggesting how anyone should organize their sanctuary, but we don't have any trepidation, for example, of having uh, an American flag in the, in the, in the worship sanctuary, um, because for us, those two things go together as American Christians. I mean, I grew up in that circumstance, so I'm not suggesting something about a church that's not the church context. I grew up in myself. Um, but what that means for John is that we have too close a relationship to the entity that we are supposed to prophetically engage. And if you're too involved in the 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 um, context of the of the government or the social infrastructure around you, you can't prophetically challenge it when it needs to be challenged because you become so much a part of it that you are of it. And John's concern, I think, for contemporary Christians is that we're probably too much of the the circumstance of the in this case the United States and. It's a, it's a wonderful gift, the democracy we have. So I'm not suggesting we shouldn't have this wonderful democracy. It's, it's, it's a gift for us. And yet, even in that gift, our ultimate allegiance as Christians belongs not to that entity, but to God. And then when that entity um, does things that are against the mandates and expectations that God would have for God's people, then we are called to prophetically engage it from the perspective that God brings um, to us as Christian believers, as followers of Christ. John um, is concerned that um, his folk in, um, in the first century aren't able to do that because they're wanting to buy in. I think if he looked at our churches today, he would be concerned that we've already bought in too much. And that would be, I think, what he would write to us today in the way that he wrote to his churches. I think he, he, he'd want, you know, his, one of his big um, uh, notions was that, um, that his churches should come out of their relationship with Rome. At the end of the book of Revelation, come out of her, my people, is what he cries out. I think in many cases, um, that would be the cry to the contemporary Christian church. Um, you've got to figure out where your ultimate allegiance is, and I want your ultimate allegiance to be to God. That, that idea that the church today, or at least maybe the American church or the white church today, is the fulfillment of what John was so worried about is interesting yeah. when you think about, like you said, revelation as an unveiling or as a revealing I'm gonna show you the truth about this thing that you desire and you're gonna see it's, it's monstrous. It's not beautiful like you thought. That's one thing to do for an, a church that's over here away from the empire. And you know, for us who are enmeshed, that revealing is terrifying or should be perhaps more terrifying because we've been tricked or we've succumbed or we're complicit or we're somehow in it, you know, see what I mean? If Revelation's a frightening book <laughs> because of its imagery and how it's been used as it is, like you said, what that book would look like written to a church that's already capitulated in some ways to the, the trappings of an imperial system. Yeah, well, you know, I, I can't remember who said it now, but uh, um, many years ago I read one author who said, well, you know, uh, people are afraid of the book of Revelation. Um, uh, ultimately, when you really understand the book of Revelation, you ought not to be afraid because of its symbolism. You ought to be afraid because of what it's saying to the church. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that happens at, toward the start of Revelation, right, those seven letters to the seven churches in chapters two and three, where the author John calls the churches to bear witness, he also tells several of those churches to repent. Yes, yes. Uh, Mark's gospel, well, most of the gospel, but Mark's gospel in particular, the first thing that John the baptizer is doing is calling for repentance. Mm -hmm. Other biblical authors talk about it, but you know, those are your two books, your mm -hmm. two, uh, the books you've yeah. written. <laughs> right. 
uh, help us think about what does that mean? How does, why do we, why does, why do those books speak about repentance, but why do they begin in some ways with repentance also? Yeah, I think they begin with repentance because both of them believe we're in a broken relationship that we veered off our course um, um, with God that we should have. In the Gospel of Mark, the understanding is that we become trapped in some way. I see God's, uh, Jesus in the Gospel of Mark as God's invasion into our world, an invasion to overcome the brokenness that we have succumbed to in our world. John prepares the way for it. Jesus comes, as you know, in Mark 1, 14 and 15, the reign of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. The good news is God's broken in. God has intervened. The, um, the discipleship news is you've got to now adjust to that, and the language of that adjustment is repentance, meaning you've been going off in this direction, and God is calling you back into this particular direction right here. How can you get back in gear with where God is? Now, one of the things that's interesting for me in the Gospel of Mark, you, you, I mean, most people remember that um, repent comes from that Hebrew shuv, which means you've been You've, you've been on the track with God, you've gotten off the track, now you need to come back and get back in right relationship. In the Gospel of Mark, that language of repentance, when it happens, uh, what happens next is you don't have people, um, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, you don't have them going back to change something that was going behind them. Uh, what you're called, or what they're called to do is to have a radical transformation going into the future. In other words, their lives can no longer be what their lives were. They can't be fishers the way they were fishers before. They've got to do a new kind of fishing now. So repentance isn't just looking back and looking at where I've gone astray and getting back on track. It's also looking forward and realizing I was on the wrong track going forward. Now I've got to adjust and get back over here so I can get to where God needs me to be. And where does God need me to be? Well, Jesus, of course, is leading the path um, that you follow for that direction. So that's how I see repentance in the Gospel of Mark. Um, and then how would I apply that to today? We'll look at the world in which we find ourselves. Uh, the rain, if we hear the language, the reign of God is at hand. Is it? Is it truly at hand? Well, what do we do? We respond by now going forward in a way that's different from what we had ever anticipated. And this thing that's happening now, what's going on in relationship that was triggered by the George Floyd event, that may well be an invasive moment. It's a negative moment, but it's an invasive moment that gives us an opportunity to think about how we had constructed our future and why we ought to make a change, a shift in it, the same way that those fishers of fish needed to make a change and become fishers of people. So repentance in that sense from the Gospel of Mark. In the book of Revelation, yes, that language of uh, repentance, um, here is repentance of, 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 of uh, you've been blending in um, to the ways and expectations um, and, the, and the threats of the Roman Empire. The expectations, well, if I become more like the Greeks and the Romans, I'll prosper financially, I'll prosper politically, I'll prosper socially. And um, the threats, well, if I behave more like the Greeks and Romans, I won't lose this, I won't lose that, I won't lose my life, I won't be exiled over here. So between those threats and promises, I bought into being like the Greeks and Romans around me. John is saying, well, you can't go forward doing that, you've got to change, repent. So repent in that sense means now change Change your attitude toward the world around you, readjust it so that you're now more focused in the way that God expects you to be focused. And I think the message there is as, as meaningful for us today as it was for John's church then. Have we blended in? Um, and if we have, um, here is our call to repent, to change um, from that kind of expectation and hope that we can be like everybody else because we're not, or we're not supposed to be. I sometimes fall into the trap of thinking that repentance is what happens in confession and forgiveness, like in the course of a church service. It's the thing we have to get out of the way so that we can move on. Yeah, the old confession of sin. The real work, right? It's just, you know, confession is great. It's important. It's a, it's, yeah. There's a reason we do it early in the church service. It's a declaration of pardon. I can move forward. But repentance, the way you talk about it is never goes away, right? We continue That's to right, repent yeah. because we're living into that. And so it's more than just feeling bad. It's more than just laying something before God, but it's actually now resolving a different way of, of being in the world. Like you said, being back on track. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you know, I would press that, um, 
uh, in some cases, it's about feeling bad. In other cases, not so much about feeling bad. It's about recognizing that I've, I'm, I'm on the wrong track. And, um, and so when I talk about, if we think about today again, um, uh, it's not so much about wanting people to feel guilty about the wrongs they've done. Um, and it's not so much about the society being guilty about its racism. Yeah, you want that. I mean, you want to recognize that um, there's guilt there. But the focus is really on what can we become now? Having recognized that we've not been where God wants us to be, what can we become now? So lose the feeling bad and start figuring out how you can reconstruct. Yeah. I have a slightly different question, but still in the, in the, the vein of the book of Revelation. And that's about how angry the book is. You've written that Revelation is an angry book. That we have to acknowledge that, that it's a book that is the, the author is clearly upset with the Roman Empire. The author is upset with these churches that are not measuring up. Um, and the author imagines a God who might not be angry, but certainly is going to come with, with frightening recompense. And so a lot of people are turned off by the book because it's, it, it doesn't necessarily fit our, our standard image of, of a gracious God and the God that we meet in Jesus Christ. But you, um, in some of your writing in Revelation, have counseled your readers. You have to sit with that anger for a while and recognize what that's like. I just wonder, anger is in the air right now. We talk about righteous anger, and we talk about people who have a right to be angry. Churches tend to be a little afraid of bringing anger too close because right, unchecked anger can cause problems and it can, it can divide. You want us to talk a little bit about that? Are there ways in which the idea of the anger of the book of Revelation or God's anger in the face of injustice might be helpful for us to, if not express, at least to listen to or what that looks like for you these days? Yeah, yeah. That is one of the most difficult parts of the book of Revelation for me, realizing the anger that bubbles in it. Um, there's also the anger, I think, that um, John's, uh, John feels, and he knows as Christians feel, well, they're angry about the fact that they are believers, the ones who are believers, um, and the world is so messed up. You know, in Revelation 6, 9 through 11, how long, um, God, um, will we have to endure this before you avenge us, before you do something about, uh, so theodicy is, is it, they're angry about um, how can you have a just and good God and we be suffering the way we are. We be, we're in the circumstance we're caught up in. Um, God too, yes, certainly is angry because of the way in which evil has infested um, the institutions and the people of the world and how that has now transformed in a hostile way um, the good creation that God had, had brought forward. So how, how does that anger live itself out? Well, in the book of Revelation, the hopeful piece is that there is a plan and a program for that anger. So it's not anger that's out of control. It's anger that is constructed toward a telos, a goal. Um, and of course, the goal is chapters 20 um, uh, through 22, where you get the new heaven and the new earth. There is a constructive purpose for the anger. Now, that you still have to deal with the fact that there is a lot of anger in the book. Um, what is hopeful is that there is a constructive telos or goal that is being moved toward that is positive, that overcomes both the need for anger and the hostility that created the anger in the first place. Um, as you know, I could probably spend a whole lot, of, a lot more time than just in this, this small answer on that issue because it's a huge issue for the book of Revelation. But, you know, I think, uh, as you know, I, I did this little book, Can I Get a Witness, reading the book of Revelation through an African-American lens, and I was reading through the lens of the civil rights movement. There is a holy, righteous anger about um, the segregation, the Jim Crow laws of the, um, of the, uh, well, the, the segregation laws of the Jim Crow period that led up to the civil rights movement in the 60s. And um, there is um, a great deal of anger about the way in which black people were treated and um, the rights that were denied, the injustice that was compiling itself um, through that period. But what was important, um, particularly the strongest wave of the civil rights movement, was this intense education and structure about nonviolence. Um, that was directed toward a particular telos and goal. And the goal wasn't that um, black people in the end 
become superior to everybody else, but that there becomes an equality. Um, so there's a particular goal, and how do you get to that goal? You get the creation of a just society. You can't create that on, on, on violence. You create that on love, and out of anger, you put that love into motion. I think really that's ultimately what John is saying here. The love in motion is the lamb. And the lamb, how does the lamb operate? The lamb operates and conquers through his death on the cross. It, the language of slaughtering, being slaughtered. That's the image and the, um, the, the, the model that the book of Revelation gives to the Christ believer. You follow, you witness as Christ witnessed, you conquer as Christ conquered, and you do that by keeping a goal on this expectation of a new heaven and a new earth. How do you get there? You get there through nonviolently witnessing and conquering the way Christ conquered. And I think the civil rights movement tried to live into that vision. And I think that's going to be one of the hopeful possibilities for us today. People ought to be angry about a lot of the things that are happening in our world. I'm angry about um, significant things related to the circumstances we've been talking about. Um, how do I then con constructively um, a position that anger so that it's pointing toward a goal and it is moving toward that goal using a methodology that will help that goal be achieved. And that's what the civil rights movement did. I think that's what John is suggesting um, Christ believers who follow the image of the crucified or the slaughtered lamb can do in the first century. So yes, recognize the anger, use the anger, but use it constructively and use it with a purpose. I have a theory that white churches, I'll speak for myself, I have a theory that I sometimes am too quick to embrace this notion of righteous anger because it can yeah. become, for me, a shortcut away from repentance or away from naming complicity. You see what I mean? That maybe some of the anger should be directed toward myself. Yeah. yeah. Not in a self-loathing, I'm horrible kind of, you know, I mean, but in a way that's honest, right? That speaks the truth. I, I do. That's my, that's my theory. I don't know if you want to weigh in on my theory, but that, because well, anger can be seductive for some people who don't want to do that hard work of ownership, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I read an article recently that, that the, the title of the article was, um, 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 why, does, why does being angry make me feel so good? Or something like that. Um, that, that anger does become seductive in that way. But I agree with you. And, you know, the piece, the reflection piece that you noted at the outset of our conversation that I, I wrote recently in response to what happened to uh, George Floyd and, and the circumstances leading up to that, I started with the same thing you're saying. I'm angry with myself. I'm recognizing that I haven't witnessed the love. So first, I think before you ask other people to adjust and repent and move forward, you have to recognize that you must call up and ask and expect of yourself, call out of yourself um, first before you can legitimately call something out of someone else. And, you know, I think John believes he did that because he did, he's not asking people to witness um, in a way that he himself has not. He's telling you right from the beginning, I'm out here on Patmos because I did what I'm asking you to do. I start with me and then I ask you, and I think that's an important um, place to begin as well. Because that's how you gain the authenticity to be able to have a sense of authority to ask the things that you ask. Good, yeah. So just for people who don't, yeah, John the author is, appears to be exiled on an island, a small island in the Aegean Sea because of his witness. Since we're talking about my emotions uh, <laughs> and yours too, and you mentioned the article, which if people haven't read yet, hopefully they've paused and, and found this, the statement, this, this short statement in response to George Floyd's murder. I, it took my breath away at the beginning of that. You didn't just talk about anger at yourself, you talked about fear, mm -hmm. which is another one of those emotions we don't like to bring too close in church sometimes because we've been taught perfect love casts out all fear. And Jesus says, you know, do not be afraid. Uh, which, of course, made me think of Mark's gospel and the ending of that, of that gospel with women running away in fear and terror and, and the way in which faith and fear have this, they're not quite opposites in Mark's gospel, but they sometimes show up at the same time. And what's the role of fear right now in this? Is it something we get over? Is it something that we embrace? Is it just what it means to be a disciple, is to live in a bit of fear? Or what, what do you think of that? Well, I think living as a disciple, um, you do live in a bit of fear. Um, one of the things 
I've noted in the Gospel of Mark, you know, there, there's this point where Jesus is heading to Jerusalem and his disciples say, well, let us go with him that we may die there with him or something like that. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Um, but um, I remember writing in a lecture, I believe it was, that I said, um, finally, um, they get it. You know, the disciples have been stumbling and bumbling up to this point. But finally, they get it. They're right to be afraid. They recognize why they're right to be, because they see now how it's developing, what's happening in front of them. So one of the um, realities, I think, is that someone who follows the way of this Jesus of Nazareth will recognize that it's not illogical to be afraid, that it's logical because of the very transformational kind of things he's happening and the stakes that are involved with the kinds of things he's doing. So first, I, I want to acknowledge that it's um, not an unreasonable um, um, feeling to have. Um, the second thing I would point out is that um, the question is, how does one use that fear? How does one work with that fear? Does it become debilitating or does it become energizing? I, um, I remember talking to a friend when I'm all the way back in my college days. He was just this really bright student, did really well in college, and I was asking him once my freshman year, toward the end of my freshman year, um, how um, uh, he um, so consistently did so well and he said well you know fear is a great motivator and I learned that and kept that with me for quite some I, I think um, fear can be a positive in the sense that we recognize um, that uh, we're called to a certain stance or certain level given the capabilities and the gifts we have um, I think it's healthy to fear that we're not living up to the expectations that God has for us. And I certainly think John and, and the book of Revelation thought that about his churches. That's why he kept pushing them to live into those expectations. So fear can be a great motivator in that sense as well. And um, I think in the end, um, fear can um, also help us see more clearly um, the circumstances around us. I've read things about um, soldier I, I now hope i will never be in a situation of combat but i've read these things of soldiers who found themselves in such circumstances or other people in in grave physical um threat um to themselves that um, there's a heightened sense of um of um understanding and recognizing the circumstances and the environment around them there's an, a, an acuteness to their senses it takes on um, you know, this sense of um, being in fear of the Lord, I think of in that terms. To be in relationship with God, there's an, a heightening, an increasing. It's not a fear in the debilitating sense. It's a fear is a sharpening of respect and uh, recognition that I'm in the presence of something that's calling me to be the best thing I can be. And how can I live into that circumstance? And then um, I think finally, um, fear is used as a good example in the Gospel of Mark at the ending. I think, you know, my, my take on the ending of Mark's Gospel is that, um, that the women, um, the first, the male disciples are afraid and they scatter and leave Jesus. And the women who are the disciples who come at the end, they're the last hope. And then that seems hopeless because they don't say anything to anyone because they are afraid and they kind of wander off. Well, how, do, how does Mark then expect that the good news is going to be shared in the way that he hopes since all of his characters have let him down? And my understanding and reading of that ending of the gospel is, is this is Mark's way of inviting the reader to step in. Well, if the characters in the text won't do it, then it's your opportunity. You recognize, yes, there's a lot to be afraid of following Jesus, but you're being called in the midst of that fear to live into that expectation, to be propelled into that expectation. So the fear in the gospel is a teaching moment in the same way as well. So I think a lot about that fear, um, but I try to see fear um, from that biblical perspective as an invitation to um, heighten our awareness of what God is doing in the world around us and then to follow and finish that story of the gospel um, that Jesus began. And that fear is not a bad response to people who are planning to bear witness to somebody who was just executed yeah, yeah. by the state for, for preaching peace. I think a lot of what you've been saying would be terrifying to me if I heard you saying it to me, this is an individual, but I, I imagine the church is a larger context for this. I mean, some of my work is as an, is as an individual. Some of it is how I do this with, with my siblings in Christ. So this is, I mean, as you think about the work of anti-racism, also as you think about what makes that harder now with the pandemic and our limited ways of being in community, what do you think are some of the characteristics that are helping churches change right now or could help churches change? What are the churches, what churches are best equipped to step into this moment from your perspective? Yeah, um, yeah that's a good, good question. I've just been reading this book. 
um, that Fortress Press is going to be doing, um, publishing, I guess, next year. And it's about the intersectional church. And uh, the intersectional church is described in this book is a church where people of different backgrounds, relationships, identities collide together in positive, creative, and productive ways to witness to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in this world. Um, I think the more we can um, uh, reflect the glory of God's uh, multiform creation in our churches, um, the more uh, equipped or better equipped we are um, to hear the cries of God's people coming out of different identities and circumstances around us. So the more um, we can become that intersectional kind of reality or move toward it, I think the stronger we become in these circumstances today. Uh, very often, you know, the, the church, my church, your church probably, many churches don't look like the world in which the church serves um, because we're very much people like us in those contexts. How do we find ways of being able to um, um, help our church, if not in membership, then in mission, um, be more identified with the glory and beauty of God's diverse creation? So I, because um, one of the ways you can hear the struggles and cries of people who are not like you is to be engaged in mission and ministry with people who are not like you. Um, you know, one of the things that we found, I mean, that we found, but um, um, statistically found in terms of uh, people being willing to hear the voices of others is not so much learning about them in books, um, but being in relationship with people who are considered to be other. Um, so that the more um, uh, persons that you know who are not of your race or not of your gender or not of your economic status, um, who are not of your geographical location, um, the better equipped you're able to hear someone out of that different context cry out for help. And, 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 and I think churches that are more intersectional are, are positioned in that way. Um, I'd say also, um, and this is probably no surprise to you, but um, the more deeply vested we are in the biblical materials and traditions um, so that we actually know them, the more compelled we are to um, be concerned about um, people who are struggling in the world around us. Um, you know, you and I both teach biblical studies. Um, one of the things I've noted, I started back in 1992, um, graduating from Emory and going to Princeton to teach. Um, and uh, I mean, going back to my own MDiv days and I graduated from seminary in 1981, there's been this progression I've noticed of a, a, a growing biblical illiteracy across those periods of time. So that we have to spend a whole lot more time just teaching the content of biblical materials, even to people who are coming to seminary. So then you go into church context and they're, I mean, um, People just don't know the biblical stories. So, you know, one of the things I've said in sermons is how can we expect congregations to live into the ministry of Jesus when they really don't know what that ministry is? They, I mean, they don't know the stories. They don't know the, 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 um, the desperate um, um, connection that God has through Jesus with people who are struggling in this world. And so when you hear it sometimes um, from someone who's saying we need to pay attention to these circumstances that are happening in the world around us, you say, well, I want to be biblical. I don't, I, I want to be spiritual. I don't want to deal with these political things. But then you take them to the biblical text and say, oh, well, that's the kind of thing Jesus was invested in. So the more biblical I think we can be, I think the, the, the more invested we'll be in the circumstances in the world around us. So I'll say intersectional and biblical. I'll start there. I, I like both of those. Those are both big challenges, too. And they might be things that we do together as well. We start reading the yeah. Bible with people different from you. With different yeah, 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 yeah. You see things. One more question for you, and I'll let you go. And that's, uh, you're president of a seminary. Most people probably assume that means you raise money all day long. <laughs> <You're part laughs> that's of a lot of what I do. That's, that's what I right. assume you do. But you also you also set the ethos of a school, and you motivate the faculty, and you motivate the staff, you motivate the student body. Uh, and your your the the mission of your school is to provide leadership for congregations and other forms of Christian witness in the coming years and generations. What are you telling people there? Now, I know it's summertime, but what are you telling people there now that you weren't talking about four months ago before the, the pandemic appeared with such ferocity and, and showed itself to be such an exposer of systemic injustices in our nation, as well as just 
uh, horrible to community and a real challenge to church's ability to do ministry in the ways we've become accustomed. Are you saying anything new or? Well, you know, interestingly enough, we were, um, there were some things that we were saying that I, hope, I think have co connected with what's happening that we didn't anticipate a lot of these, the pandemic and, you know, these types of things that were happening. And certainly, um, you know, that, well, I don't even know what word tragedy is and isn't enough of a word to describe uh, those eight minutes and 46 seconds with George Floyd. Um, but um, we were trying to live into a better strategic vision. We call our tagline for the seminary as a church in the world. We were trying to figure out, well, how can we be better at being or investing in leadership for the church in the world? And so we were beginning to think about a couple of things in our, we just created a new strategic vision. And one of them was, we need to be a much more diverse intersectional um, seminary community than we have been in our faculty, in our um, student body, in our staff, and the way in which we reach out, engage in churches or in communities and invest in churches and communities around us. So that was a part of the conversation when all of this happened. We were also thinking about um, how we can better use technology and the way that we teach. So again, you know, the pandemic happens and we're, we can move somewhat seamlessly into that, but we know that there, there are things that um, we weren't ready for that um, we had, but we were beginning to think about that. And this now accelerates that thinking in a broad way. We had just developed, um, 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 is now maybe a year old, a Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation that now lives into these very conversations. It, um, uh, um, last week, um, we had a forum through the Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation on um, what can white Christians do about racism. Um, that, um, and, and we're now looking at um, um, issues related to um, symbols and you know uh, monuments and other things and how they relate to um, and, 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 and oftentimes encourage a sense of, um, of, of injustice. Uh, so uh, that was something that was a part of what we were doing. And then um, we had this, we created a Center for Womanist Leadership to look at um, women of color and how they're impacted. And then finally, in talking with the, the directors of the Center of Women, Womanist Leadership and the Social Justice and Reconciliation Center, um, we talked with the faculty about a new degree program um, and looking at um, a master's in public theology that would allow us to do, invite students to come and think about the very things we're talking about right now. Uh, so, I, you know, the kind of conversation we've just had, that's the kind of conversation I hope that, that uh, students coming for that master's in public theology that they'll be having across the two years that they're on the campus. So these are things that um, I hope we can live further into, um, but we were thinking about them, and um, now we ramp up that thinking given the circumstance that we find ourselves in today. Um, and I hope we can um, continue to think creatively about how we can use our resources in a better way to respond to what the church and the world finds itself confronted with in our, in our circumstance. It's a great answer. <laughs> I hope this conversation leads to many more conversations at Westminster and, and beyond as well. You've given us a lot to think about. I, I wanna thank you for your witness there in Richmond and beyond. Uh, for giving me courage, for calling me to action, and uh, all that you've taught me today and, and over the years. And thank you so much for spending some time with us. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. And my, and, and my regards to everyone there at Westminster. <laughs>